Hello and welcome to Croftlands Community Church. I hope you're all keeping well. Part of our service today is coming from the foot of the highest mountain in England, that Scaffold Pike in the Lake District, and part of it will hopefully be coming from the top, if we make it. If we don't make it, it might be due to my dodgy compass. <laughs> we'll look at that a bit later in the service. One of the things that we want to be as a church is a place that's really welcoming, where people feel valued and loved. And with that in mind, our first song celebrates many of the mountains that Jesus moved so that we could be welcomed into God's presence. And this song is sung from Jesus' perspective. us with hearts to know you, to know that our very existence is deeply embedded in the unfailing, overwhelming love that flows from your Father heart to each one of us. Lord, we confess our hearts are broken, hard, cold, locked away, dysfunctional, disconnected from you, and have become containers for bitterness, ingratitude, critical attitudes, hatred and unforgiveness towards others. 
Lord, your only requirement is that we are honest with you about what dwells in the innermost recesses of our hearts and confess that we do not know your love and have not shown love to others. We have judged who we consider to be worthy before we offer the fruits of our love for others with kindness, patience, compassion, encouragement and generosity. We lift our eyes to the mountains and ask, where does our help come from? Our help comes from you, the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Help us to set our hearts to pilgrimage, a journey into the terrain of love that we so desperately need for our wholeness and healing. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So the top of the mountain is in sight, which is good, but we've still got a long, long way to go. There's a real holiday feel here on the mountain, lots of people going up and down, and of course it is the holiday season, which means it's time for Holiday Club. And this year we have a very different kind of Holiday Club, and Mark is going to tell us all about it. Thanks, Mark. Hello. Normally at this time of year I would be stood here talking to you guys uh, surrounded by loads and loads of equipment as we would have been set up and ready to start Holiday Club tomorrow, Monday. Now, this year, of course, that isn't happening. We're not expecting 70-year-old children to come rushing in because of the current situation with COVID-19. So we decided a few months ago that we need to do something, and we decided to do Holiday Club at home. So over the last few weeks uh, we have been putting together a program which will be put out for children to watch. There'll be one program each day of the next five days from Monday, tomorrow through to Friday. And we're going to be having the usual things we normally have at Holiday Club. We're going to be having singing, we're going to be having the crafts, we're going to be having a story, reflection time. We've even got competitions as well. Hopefully some of the children will be able to email in their competition entries to us and we'll be able to display some during the week and also to announce the winners on the service next Sunday. Well Catherine and Mervyn have asked me just to have a brief overview of what Holiday Club is about this year. Now having thought long and hard about this we decided that we would look at five children from the Bible, three from the Old Testament and two from the New Testament. Um, the first one we thought about was Samuel. Samuel was dedicated to God as a small child and he was the one that listened to God. He heard God's voice and he went to speak to Eli about what God said to him, the message that he had. So our first child that we were looking at would be the life of Samuel when he was called by God. And the theme is listening. And the fact is that we are never too young to hear from God, whether it's like Samuel did in an audible way, whether it's through what somebody else tells us, or whether it's from simply just like reading the Bible. Of course, Samuel went on to become a prophet, and he was the last judge of Israel, and also anointed the first two kings of Israel. That was Saul, which didn't go particularly brilliantly. And then we had David. And funnily enough, our second child is David. David, being a shepherd boy out in the fields, went off to take some provisions to his three brothers fighting with the Philistines and came face to face with Goliath in the end. Now, he defeated the giant Goliath using a small stone. And he put his trust in God. So that's our second theme, looking at David, putting our trust in God, as the young shepherd boy David did, because he stood there in front of that giant, and he spoke to him. He listed all the weaponry that the giant had, and quite simply David said, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty the commander of the armies of Israel. And basically he said, today, I'm going to take you down. 
and sure enough, he did. And later became the king, as we all know, and it's hailed that he was the greatest king that Israel ever had. Then we're going to fast forward a little bit. And our next child we thought about was a girl. The thing is, we don't know her name. Her name isn't mentioned in the Bible. We just know she was a servant girl. That once the country had split apart, Israel and Judah had split, she was taken as a, to become a servant in the household of a commander of the army. The commander's name we know, Naaman. Except the commander had a problem. Leprosy. We read his story in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5. And it, she may have seen him one day, may have had to have assisted him with his armour, maybe, we don't know. And went to her mistress, his wife, and said, If only my master would go to speak to the prophet who is in my country, then he will pray for him and he will be healed. And sure enough, Naaman goes off to see Elisha, and Elisha prays, and the man is healed. The man had to trust. The man also had to listen. So there's a link to the other two children there. But it's the girl. What did she do? She shared God with somebody else that was older and in more authority over her. We're never too young to share the gospel message with the people that are around us. Then we move on into the New Testament and another unnamed child. This one is mentioned in three gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark and Luke all record this story. And it starts with a young boy going off, probably for the day, probably like we would normally go to the cinema or a theatre or go and play with our mates in the park or just go out for a bike ride or skate park or whatever. He was going off for the day and what he was going to do to be entertained. And he was going to listen to Jesus. And his mum had packed him up a packed lunch, five loaves and two fish. Realising that it was getting late, that the food, there was nothing there for the people to eat. The disciples, as you know, wanted to dismiss the um, people away. And this boy came and said, well, I've got my packed lunch still, my five loaves and my two fish. Maybe he was just so overawed by the fact that Jesus was saying what he was saying, that he just forgot to eat his packed lunch. Uh, and he got caught up in the moment. And it was, we all know the story, there were 5,000 men, it tells us, in the gospel accounts, plus women, plus children. So if every man had a wife, then that's 10,000. If they had a couple of kids, well, you can guess the numbers that we're talking about. And he shared his five loaves and his two fish. He was generous with his food, giving what little he had, what little he had been given. And Jesus used that and multiplied it many, many times over. So the theme for the... Day four is generosity and using what little we have been given and giving it to God to be used by him in whatever way. Then we track back a little bit in time to a time before Jesus' public ministry. It's the only account that we have of Jesus as a child apart from the birth stories that are covered in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. And it's a time when Jesus was at the temple He'd gone down for a festival with his mum and dad, travelled in a large group. I could quite well imagine that John, who became John the Baptist, his cousin, was probably there with him, as boys do, messing about on the way down in a large party. But then a day's journey back from the festival, mum and dad realised he wasn't there. And they found him three days later, sitting in the temple courts, listening to the elders and the teachers of the law, and discussing with them, at a, a level that we will never understand because we don't know what was said. We're never too young to learn the truths that are in the Bible. But also, I think, we're never too old either to learn the truths that are in the Bible. And that's the important thing. We didn't really give day five a theme. It's just Jesus at the temple. But it's that soaking up of knowledge that is, we want to get across the children. There are people in our 
we, we know from the work we do within schools that there are some people that look at the Bible and the stories contained within it, you know, fighting giants, hearing God's voice, doing a remarkable healings and stuff like that. And they say, they put, it in, in, they put the Bible in the realms of fantasy, uh, fiction, so many fiction books around that children read today. And they put it in that, that, that realm. But actually, when you read this, the facts that are in here, you can look up what happened with Naaman. He was a commander of the army, the army of Aram or Assyria. And the name of his king is mentioned not just in the Bible, but in other historical sources too, which backs up the stories that you read in the Bible. And we want to get that message across to children, that this is, may well, the contents of what we have as the Bible today may well have stopped just under 2,000 years ago being created into the Bible. But those truths that are in there are the same as they, back then as they are today and will be in the future. It's not a work of fiction, it's a work of, of fact, of God, his love, and his working his purpose out through us, no matter how small we may be. We're quite excited by Holiday Club at home this year. Normally, about this time, we would be able to tell you approximately how many kids had booked in and we'd sent consent forms to. Of course, this year there's been no registration. Normally, there would be around about... 78, 80 children would have registered and they, they would have name badges and they'd be waiting for them to come through and there'd be people like Amy and Sheila waiting on the door to greet them and things like that. We don't know how many people are going to view these videos. We do know, though, that there are going to be people watching these videos up and down and across the length and breadth of our country. We know that people are going to be watching these in Kent. We know people are going to be watching them in Cornwall and Devon area. We know people are going to be watching this in Swansea in South Wales and we know that people are going to be watching in the Midlands and in the Merseyside St Helens area and of course here in Cumbria children are going to be watching these videos. We've emailed all the families that came last year to Holiday Club as well as all the schools that Sarah and I have contact with. We've emailed all of them and there's even going to be children watching this way up in Bishop Auckland um, and they have got a special message on the videos for the children up there, I mean, added to them. We also heard the children have been watching this as far afield as Brisbane in Australia. So far and wide. And it's exciting that we may never know how many people are going to be watching this or how many lives are going to be touched by this. Now, as I speak to you now, the videos that the children are going to be watching will already be produced, they'll be ready, they'll be waiting for the children to watch them tomorrow morning. So that work's been done, but please still pray. Pray that the videos are all successful in the downloads and the children watch them, there's no lagging and delaying and stuff like that. Pray for the technology to continue to upload some of this stuff that's going to go onto the internet. Um, but pray for the children that are going to be listening, like Samuel did, listen to the words that are coming out from these videos. Pray for their families. They may well be looking at watching these with their families. Their families may be getting involved because we've asked them to do crafts and we've asked them to join in in competitions. They're going to need a parent to help with that and they're going to be getting that message too. So just hold us all up in your prayers. In some senses, the hard work for us this year has already been done. And somebody did say to me earlier on, you will be able to have a rest of Holiday Club Week. Well, we'll, we'll see how that's going to work out. But please continue to pray for these videos and the impact they're going to have on the lives of children, not just only in our area or this country, but maybe across the world too. Thank you, Mark, Sarah and all the team for all the hard work that's gone into preparing Holiday Club this year. We really do appreciate your work. It really has been a mountain for you to climb. So thank you so much. And now let's just take a moment to pray for all the children that will engage with Holiday Club. Father God, I do want to thank you for all that work and energy that's gone into preparing Holiday Club this year. And I ask that you would bless it. I want to pray that many children across the country would engage with the songs, the stories, the Bible verses and the craft activities 
and that as they do this, their hearts would be open to receive the truths of your kingdom and that the seeds of your love would fall on good ground and bear much fruit. And I want to pray particularly as well for Mark as he has to upload all the videos this week. I pray that that would be smooth um, and that that would go without too many hitches. And so I ask these things in your name, Lord Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. So it is the time of year when lots of us think about getting away for a holiday, to have a change of scenery and to be refreshed. I wonder what your dream destination would be. Well, before our Bible reading today, I'm going to take you to some of the world's top destinations uh, by the wonders of modern technology. Perhaps you might like a gondola ride in Venice. Very nice. I'd be up for that. Or you might like to marvel at the pyramids in Egypt and enjoy that wonderful sunshine. You may like to go for a stroll in the lavender fields of Tuscany or perhaps just relax on a beautiful beach on the Isles of Scilly. What a beautiful planet God has created for us to enjoy. Our Bible reading today is filled with longing for a particular location and it's brought to us by the Biscuit Sisters. Now, normally at this time of year, Diane and Jean would serve biscuits at the Holiday Club and they're known as the Biscuit Sisters. But because there's no children to serve biscuits to this year, they're redundant. So they're going to serve us our Bible reading instead. Thank you, Diane and Jean. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. And now verses 8 to 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favour on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk his blameless. Thank you, Diane and Jean and Penny the Cat. <laughs> Let's take a closer look at Psalm 84. There's so much that we could unpack in this psalm, but I just want to share a few things that have jumped out at me recently. And the first thing is, who actually wrote the psalm? This psalm is written by the sons of Korah. And who were the sons of Korah? This is a fascinating story in itself and is a journey from devastation to delight. Korah, an Israelite from the tribe of Levi takes the limelight when he leads a rebellion against Moses. You can read his story in Numbers chapter 16. And as a result of this rebellion, Korah and the majority of his family are destroyed. But his family line did just survive. And from that line, we get the great prophet Samuel, who led Israel for many years. And then later, King David appointed members of Korah's family as worship leaders, and they wrote some of the most intimate psalms yearning for God's presence, like, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, from Psalm 42. This ancient boy band wrote beautiful lyrics like, By day the Lord directs his love, and at night his song is with me. And, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. 
It's wonderful to see how God can bring delight out of devastation. The name of Korah is associated with a prideful rebellion and these humble intimate psalms. Perhaps you feel labelled by something negative. God is able to develop that label into something lovely and bring beauty out of devastation in our lives. We serve a God who loves to forgive and restore. Just thinking about the Sons of Korah being an ancient boy band got me thinking about the Spice Girls. <laughs> We've got the Spice Girls in our church and maybe some of the chaps might like to form the Sons of Korah. <laughs> no pressure. Anyway, <laughs> Psalm 84 kicks off in the true Sons of Korah fashion by delighting and longing for God's presence. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My song yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. These words tap into the deep ache in the human heart to be truly at home in God's presence. Back in the Garden of Eden, our ancestors had unhindered access to the presence and glory of God, the only thing that can truly satisfy the human heart. And since the fall, we've been trying every which way to find that missing ingredient and satisfy that low, constant ache. Interestingly, it says that even my flesh cries out for God. The flesh is normally associated with our sinful nature that pulls us away from God. But this is somehow acknowledging that no carnal pleasure can ultimately satisfy even the flesh and that the things the flesh runs after is sometimes a quest to find God. The next part of the psalm that spoke to me were verses 5 and 6 where it says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. I'm struck by the phrase, they set their hearts on pilgrimage. And firstly, that the concept of the word set. This is a definite decision and action, not I want to go God's way, or I'd like to go God's way, or I may go God's way, but I'm going to go God's way. Set their hearts on pilgrimage. And when we speak that out and act on it, God releases his power and strengthens us. And it says they go from strength to strength. I've been thinking about different settings on the human heart and here are a few that I've identified on my own. And to help us visualise, I've made my own heart compass. And when I'm talking about the heart today, I'm not talking about the physical pump that pumps the blood around inside. I'm talking about the inner world where our emotions and spirit and soul dwell and where they mulch our feelings. And <clears throat> so that's what we're thinking about today. Now, this is a, a bit clumpy and clumsy, but the first thing we need to acknowledge is that our hearts can often be broken in different areas and that they are incredibly complex, <laughs> not like this. <laughs> um, but the first setting I want us to look at is, um, let's go for F. Um, and sometimes we set our self um, in this place. I've got F for frozen. And for various reasons, we can find that our hearts are frozen or emotionally switched off. We can find that maybe we're imprisoned by fear, abuse, hurt and shame. And it's a very real and valid setting. But we miss out on so much and neglect those around us if we spend too long parked in this place. Uh, the next one. Uh, let's go to E. Um, for E, I've got easy life. Uh, basically, just fit in, keep your head down and don't rock the boat. Avoid the deep issues and skim over the top. It's not necessarily a bad setting, but possibly a waste of potential and not a good place to spend your whole life. Um, and let's go to N. Sometimes I set my heart on N and just try to, uh, sometimes we can't cope with the pain and confusion in our lives, so we just try to numb it out. We learn to, oh, N is for numb out. <laughs> we learn to anaesthetise the pain 
And there are all kinds of things we might use alcohol or food or drugs or internet habits, um, entertainment. But these things can quickly become addictive and lead us on a path of self-destruction. And this setting indicates uh, that you need help and healing. Uh, let's go to C. Sometimes we can find our hearts set here. Um, I've got C for comparisons. And never before have human beings been bombarded uh, by so many images and information about other people. And we can find ourselves comparing ourselves with others and trying to find our worth and value and place in the world. And this can lead us to feeling intimidated by some or maybe idolising and worshipping others. And idol worship can really captivate our hearts and, and entrap them and can also lead us in a downward spiral. So this, again, is not a healthy setting. And then let's go to S. And so for S, this is basically selfish. Um, and sometimes we can set our heart in this place. Basically, my needs, my pleasure, my feelings, my agenda, my way. And it's a really unhealthy place to be. I've been there a few times <laughs> and you need to kind of get away as soon as possible, which um, leaves P. And if you've been paying attention, <laughs> I'm sure you'll know what P is. P is for pilgrimage, setting our hearts on pilgrimage, journeying and moving with God and moving towards God. This is just a selection of places that our hearts can go. You may be able to relate to some of them or there may be others that you relate to. However, if we set our hearts on P, on pilgrimage, the needs and issues in all the other, uh, other areas will bit by bit be addressed, validated, healed and restored because he, Jesus, binds up the broken hearted. And Jesus said, seek first God's kingdom and everything else will be added. And Jesus also called himself the way, our route and companion on the journey. And as we choose to assertively follow him and set our hearts on pilgrimage, um, and as we journey with him over time, uh, little by little things will change. And F will change from frozen to freedom, free to love and free to feel. And N will change from numb out to new, he gives us a new and healed heart. And S will change from selfish to selfless. And we'll find ourselves having increased compassion and connection to others. Um, e may change from easy life to going the extra mile, engaging and making a difference. And C, C will change from comparison to contentment, um, knowing that God wanted someone just like you and God wanted someone just like me. We don't need to compare ourselves to other people. We can be assured that we are exactly who God wants here and now for this season. The next part of the verse that follows where it says setting their hearts on pilgrimage says that as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. Baca is translated as weeping. This assures us that as we set our hearts on pilgrimage, we will have valleys of weeping, times of pain and sadness and seasons where we have to face up to the deep hurts in our lives or the people around us. But be encouraged by these two points. Number one, the phrase, pass through. As we journey with God, times of deep sadness are temporary and he leads us through. And number two, the valleys become a place of springs. The places of pain and struggle become a source and a resource. Springs represent the bubbling up of life-giving water, which bring blessing and refreshment to all around. With God, our struggles are not meaningless, but become tools in our stories that can help others. Perhaps you're experiencing a valley of some kind at the moment. 
The coronavirus pandemic has been a metaphoric valley for many people and lots of us are really struggling with the ongoing uncertainty. But we can be assured that God is at work during this time and achieving his purposes and opening up unexpected blessings. I've been really blessed in this past week. I contacted Lou Lewis, a talented musician and songwriter from Devon. Um, her songs and music was the soundtrack to my 20s <laughs> and lots of the lyrics of her songs still float about in my head. Anyway, uh, she said that she's happy for me to use her music in any of our online services, which is a huge blessing to us. And so throughout August, we will be featuring one of her songs in each of the services. I feel as if I've been given lots of spiritual gold bars to share with the church. And we're going to have one of her songs now. It's called Valleys and it summarises some of what I've just been saying. i 
the sons of Korah go on to say that better is one day in God's house than a thousand elsewhere, and I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And then they also say that no good thing does God withhold from him whose walk is blameless. There have been a few times in my life when I've experienced a tiny taste of the presence of God and there is truly nothing to compare with the experience of being touched by the purest, gentlest, kindest love. And we can be assured that if we set our hearts on pilgrimage, that we won't miss out on any of the good things that God has in store for us. Amen. Hooray! We made it! And there's the summit just behind me. I've come down a little bit to get out of the wind, but just feeling incredibly blessed. A really beautiful walk and really blessed by the weather as well. When we set out at the bottom, there were clouds around the top, um, but as we walked up, the clouds cleared and we had a lovely gentle breeze on our back all the way up. So that was a really special. Just thinking about the words from How Great Thou Art, where it goes, says, uh, when through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, how great thou art. So a really amazing experience and also just coming up the mountain I was thinking about Jesus walking up the mountain of Calvary for us and just thinking about the devastation that he entered into so that we can share in the delight of his kingdom incredible so feeling really really blessed to have done this today and um, if I just pan this way you'll be able to see some uh, some mountains and I think there's a lake in there you can just pick out and it's wonderful as we go through this journey of life that we're able to share it with a friend and that leads to our next song what a friend we have in Jesus
We have two birthdays this week. One is Sheila, who lives on Croflands, and the other one is Becky. So we wish you both a very happy day. Happy birthday to Sheila on Monday and to Becky on Wednesday. And from the top of Scaffold Pike, it's possible to see the whole of the United Kingdom. We can see into Scotland, across the water to Ireland and Wales. And here we are standing on the highest point of England. It reminds me of a song when I was a girl. And it's some alternative words to what a friend we have in Jesus. And it used to go, Jesus loves the whosoever from whatever land they be. And he gently draws them to him for salvation, full and free. And the chorus says, all the folks from Bonnie Scotland and those from the English Dales and not forgetting dear old Ireland and the rugged hills of Wales. Here are some friends to bring that to life. That includes the folk of Bonnie Scotland. And those from the English Dales. And not forgetting dear old Ireland. And the rugged hills of Wales. And before we say the grace, I just wanted to pray from this place over the whole country. Father God, I want to ask that you would bless every church in this land, that you would pour out your spirit into the hearts of all your believers, and that as your people we would rise up to shine your light, and that many people would come to know you in these lands. For your glory, Lord Jesus. Amen. And now let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.